Five years ago today, the heady days of the Arab Spring uprisings were in full swing. The uprisings and their tragic consequences, such as the rise of revolutionary sectarian supremacism and extensive religious and ethnic cleansing, caught a bewildered America very much off guard. Syria suddenly emerged as the geopolitical battlefield of our time, producing massive death and destruction. Confusion in American thinking has been compounded by extensive disinformation warfare that inev inevitably accompanies uh, great power conflict. We are therefore very pleased tonight to be able to present an enlightening speaker who many rightly regard as America's foremost scholar on Syria. His extensive academic and journalistic articles, numerous media and conference appearances, and his renowned Syria comment website support this judgment. His history-based analysis of contemporary developments has helped many, including myself, make sense out of the current disorder in the Middle East. Let us give a warm welcome to Professor Joshua Landis, Director of Oklahoma University's Center of Middle East Studies. Thank you very much, John. What a pleasure it is to be here uh, today at Boston College. I want to thank, first and foremost, John Ebner and uh, Christian Solidarity International for inviting me here. Frank Salame of your school, who can't be here, um, was also instrumental. And um, I'd like to thank Michael Connolly for um, co-hosting this and bringing me here. It's a real pleasure. Nadine Shahate, who's going to where I'm going to speak tomorrow. And um, let me plunge in and uh, say that I'm going to try to make an argument for you that I hope will explain a little bit about what's going on in Iraq and Syria and where does ISIS come from. This is an identity-based argument. I'm talking about identity and national formation, nation building. I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore many other arguments that could be, that are, are very important to understanding Syria. Socioeconomic argument, economic, uh, economics, country versus city, many aspects that are crucial to understanding the dynamics of the Syrian civil war, ISIS, what's happening to Christians in the region. I'm going to focus on identity because I think it's one of the key elements. And let me make a comparison to what happened in Central Europe and what's happening in 11 states today. Central Europe, World War II, 11 states today. Why? There are a number of similarities. First of all, if you go from Poland to Palestine, all of these nation states were created in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference out of multi-ethnic, multi-religious empires that were destroyed. World War I was the empire-destroying war. Russian Empire, German Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and of course the Ottoman Empire for our story. Lands that did not lend themselves to neat national borders. So in Central Europe, you get Poland. Before World War II, 64% Polish. By the end of World War II, 100% Polish. Czechoslovakia, 32% minorities before World War II. By the end of World War II, all those minorities are gone. And that's the way it is right down through Central Europe. Now, we know about the six million Jews that are exterminated as this great sorting out, as I call it, takes place. The borders don't change so much as the people are changed to fit the borders. Giant refugee, waves of refugees leaving. At the end of World War II, between 45 and 47, 12 million Germans ethnically cleansed from that same area. Three million Sudeten Germans in Czechoslovakia, all gone. The Polish Germans, just as big, bigger, all gone. Half a million Germans from Romania, Yugoslavia, all ethnically cleansed. Even little Crimea, which has been in the news so much recently, 5% German. Hitler occupies it, 
uses those Crimeans as the, uh, uses those Germans as a collaborative elite to help him rule. When Stalin retakes it, all those Germans are either marched to Siberia or they flee or are killed. Just like the Palestinians, if you will, in Kuwait, when Saddam invaded in 1990. There were 300,000 Palestinians. He used them as a collaborative elite, some of them. And then as soon as he left and got driven out, the Kuwaitis kicked out all Palestinians. So did the Saudis and so forth. And they all ended up in Jordan and other places. So this great sorting out Europe, long and bloody, a zero sum game for minorities. Long and bloody, zero sum game for minorities. Of course, Yugoslavia didn't happen until a lot later, 1990. Tito is gone, it explodes into ethnic, religious, civil war. Seven nation states created a Yugoslavia today. You could even argue that what's going on in Ukraine is hopefully the end of this great sorting out. Russians versus Ukrainians being divvied up. Nation building in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire. Let's look at the Ottoman Empire for our purposes and see how this great sorting out takes place. Now in the Ottoman Empire, and it's particularly in the Levant, there's a particular coloration to the great sorting out. And that is that every one of the Levantine states, that's Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, I'm going to shoehorn Israel, Palestine to this. Got the minorities got a leg up by the colonial powers. Britain takes Iraq, Jordan, Palestine. France takes Lebanon, Syria. They give divide and conquer. They give the minorities a leg up. When they leave at the end of World War II, the colonial powers, minorities grab the state or get the lion's share of power in every one of the Levantine states. And I would argue that what's happening in the Arab Spring, in part, and what's happened more recently in the civil war in Lebanon, American invasion in Iraq, Syria, is the majority population trying to throw off this minoritarian rule and re-adjudicate the sectarian or communal balance of power in these societies. Let us just take a quick tour around. Here is, I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is nationalism and the rise of nation state. Lots of people accuse me of embracing primordial identities, but I would like to confound that argument right off the bat by saying this is new. Nationalism, nation building is a brand new. It starts with the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the twin revolutions across the Atlantic. And it is like an earthquake reorganizing the map of the world. Before this time, there are no nation states. The world has bishoprics, emirates, caliphates, empires, tribal, all kinds of free cities, all sorts of political arrangements, but not nations. Those are all going to be destroyed in the modern period. If you want to argue what is modernity in international relations, you would have to answer the nation state. Today there are what, 193 in the UN? The world has been chopped up into these nation states, cookie cutters, and that's the way the globe works. Governments represent their people. And it's much bigger than that, too, because political order has been shifted 180 degrees. Before this point, you get kings and sovereigns who rule over their subjects. With the French Revolution and nationalism, who is sovereign? The sovereign, sovereignty lies in the people. The subjects are now the sovereigns, and the rulers what do we call our rulers? We call them public servants. They're the servants of the public. So all of a sudden, sovereignty lies with the people, and the rulers are the servants. OK, that's the ideal, and everybody likes to tell us about it. But this notion is a radical change, and it's going to cause major 
upset and revolution. And most of the wars we've seen in the last 200 years are wars about borders, who's in, who's out. Let us go to Turkey, to Anatolia, the head of the Ottoman Empire. 20% Christian, 1914, before World War I. By the end of the Turkish Revolution, National Revolution, 1923, there are no more Christians in Anatolia. The three million Christians are all gone, exterminated or ethnically cleansed. We know about those pale orange ones out there, the Armenians. Of course, they're accused of being a fifth column and helping the Russians in World War I, and the Turks exterminate them, march them out to Syria. Some of them survive, Aleppo, so forth. But most, many die. Greek Orthodox, Greece at the end of World War I thinks that it can conquer Anatolia and rebuild the Byzantine Empire, presumably converting Anatolia back to Christianity. This experiment ends in disaster. Ataturk masses, builds a Turkish army, Turkish nationalism is rekindled, and as his army marches to the end of Anatolia, all the Greek Orthodox who've lived here for 2,000 years are driven out. Eight, a million and a half theoretically go to Greece. Many of them flee to Syria and other places. And 800,000 Greek Muslims transferred to Anatolia. So one out of every four Greeks today, there were about four million Greeks at the time, one out of every four Greeks is actually an Anatolian, which is why the enmity between Greece and Turkey still is so at any rate, that is the big sorting out in Turkey. Of course, the Kurds, Turkey tries to say that they're just mountain Turks and so forth, but that's, they're still trying to digest the Kurds. That is not complete yet in the nation building process. Let's look at little Cyprus. I want to fold that in here because before 73, Cyprus is your Little mosaic, Muslims and Christians, Muslims with the green, Christians with the yellow, are living side by side in villages. At the end, after the Turkish invasion, boom, sorting out. It's a perfect picture of the great sorting out. All the Muslims live in the north, all the Christians live in the south, and there isn't any mixing whatsoever. Lebanon. Lebanon, of course, is the Noah's Ark of the Levant. This big mishmash with the Christians, a slight majority in 1932, the last census in Lebanon ever taken was in 1932, when the Christians were a slight majority. Based on that, the French colonial power was able to give the Maronite Christians, the Catholics, the lion's share of power in the National Pact of 43, so that the Christian, the president had to be Christian, Maronite. The chief of staff, the head of the army, Maronite. And six out of every 11 members of parliament, Christian. So locking in a Christian power. By 1975, the beginning of the civil war in Lebanon that lasts for 15 years to 1990, the population had already shifted to a majority Muslim. They demand one man, one vote, democracy. In the name of democracy, they want to push the Christians out of this perch of theirs. War breaks out, 15 years, long and bloody. Taif Accord ends it. Today, it's 50-50 in parliament, 50 Christians. I mean, for every Christian, there's a Muslim. But the two thirds today, it's about a third, third, third. Lebanon, a third Christian, third Shiite, third Sunni. Four and a half million. But there's a million plus Syrian refugees, the vast majority of which are Sunni. They're not going to go home. This is going to completely upend the balance of power. In the same way that Palestinians in 48 came in and upended the balance and helped kindle the civil war in 1975. So we, the Lebanese story is not over. Still an awkward balance. Iraq. 
Iraq, of course, the minority that we're interested in is the Sunni minority, the yellow part. 20% of the population Sunni Arabs, 60% Shiites, Arabs, and another 20% Kurds that live in that purple part in the north. But of course, the Sunnis had the lion's share of power. Faisal, King Faisal, when the British put Iraq together, put the Sunnis at the top. They had been there under the Ottoman Empire and they just continued it. Saddam Hussein, a Sunni, the Ba'ath Party, single party state, an instrument for enshrining Sunni power at the top of Iraq society. The Iraqi army, an instrument for Sunni domination, much of the officer corps, Takritis, around Saddam. When America swanned in in 2003, in the name of promoting democracy, power sharing, what they were doing, in essence, was casting the Sunnis from the top of society down to the bottom and catapulting the Shiites from the bottom of society up to the top. So Saddam is hunted down, the Ba'ath Party is made illegal, criminalized, and the army is disbanded to be rebuilt under Maliki and others in a, in a Shiite, uh, around Shiites. The Sunnis completely disenfranchised, shoved to the margins of society, they join Al-Qaeda. America helps to destroy that, but as soon as we leave in 2010, the Shiites drive out what Sunnis are there and they are re-radicalized. And when ISIS sweeps in in 2014, it almost has to fire not one shot in order to take Fallujah and all the Sunni cities and reoccupies that yellow area. And America today, in essence, is arming up the Shiites to kill the Sunnis and drive out the Sunnis. We say we're going to do power sharing and build a new Iraq with everybody joining in, but it's not what's happening. The Kurds have independence, really, and um, the Sunnis are being destroyed. Okay, let me, long and bloody, minorities, zero-sum game. Let me shoehorn the Arab-Israeli conflict into here, Israel-Palestine. The Jews, are our minority. Of course, today they're a majority, but they were a minority. 1850, about 5% of Palestine was Jewish. 1914, 15%. 1948, when the British leave, about a third of the population. Of course, when the British leave, the Palestinians, who are two-thirds of the population, think that they will be able to dominate and rule over the Jews. 48 war ends out to be a terrible disaster for the Palestinians, is won by the Yeshuv, and 800,000, two-thirds of the Palestinians flee or are driven out and become refugees, not to be allowed back into Palestine. The Jews are able to do, to turn themselves from minority into a majority. They're the only minority in the Middle East that's able to go from being a minority to a majority. But that's, of course, because Jews have been sorted out, not only in Europe, where six million were killed, but throughout the Middle East. Baghdad, 1914, the single largest religious community in Baghdad was the Jewish community. Damascus, big thriving Jewish quarter, Aleppo. What's our, what's the great comedy about nothing? The, uh, the, um, it's finished on TV now. Yes, Seinfeld, his mother is from Aleppo. So America benefited from this great sorting out, but so did Israel. So the Jews leave Europe, leave the Middle East, are sorted out, Palestine. The Palestinians lose, zero-sum game. The Palestinians have been fighting ever since 48 to get a share of Palestine, probably won't. I don't know, maybe there will be a two-state solution, but it doesn't look very encouraging today. Zero-sum game for minorities, great sorting out, long and bloody. 
Let us go to Syria, the country of our interest today. The minority that's important here, the green part, is Alawites, about 10 to 12 percent of the Syrian population. The last census that was taken according to religion is 1960, so we're all basing our figures off of 1960 census. Syrians aren't allowed to ask religion in their sentences, just like Americans cannot. They can ask you everything else about yourself, but not your religion in our national censuses. So we don't know how many Muslims or Jews are, there are in America. We can guess, but we don't know from the census. 12% Alawites. Alawites are Shiite heterodox sect. Very radical demographic segregation. When the French arrive, to occupy Syria in 1920. The Alawites live in no town over 200 people with other Sunnis. All the cities of the coast, Latakia, Jebli, Banyas, Tartus, are Sunni cities with a small Christian minority, but no Alawites. The Alawites are servants and so forth. They live up in the mountains. Strict segregation. They're not considered Muslims and just like the Druze and Ismailis, because they're hulu, they're exact, they go beyond the bounds in religion. Think, if we want to put it, this in an American context, which doesn't work, we would think Mormons. The Alawites add a book, they add a prophet. Now, if you're a liberal, you say, fine, you're a Muslim. Alawites say, we believe in the Quran, we believe in Muhammad. We should be in, we're Muslim. If you're liberal, you say, fine. If you want to be fundamentalist about it or evangelical, you say, you can't do that. You can't add a book and you can't add a prophet, you're out. Now, fortunately, in America, we have separation of church and state. So if you're a Mormon, you can run for president. You may not win, but you can run. In Syria, Hafs al-Assad, an Alawite, ran for president. He didn't run. He put himself as president. But he tried to change the Constitution in which Article 3 says the president has to be a Muslim. Giant demonstrations from Aleppo down to Damascus, Muslim Brotherhood led them in 73. He rescinded this attempt to take out Article 3 and put it back in and said, I'm a Muslim. And anybody who says I'm not a Muslim, I'll shoot them. And that's the way it's been in Syria ever since, until the Arab Spring, when almost all the rebel groups call the Alawites Arfad, Nusayri, to indicate their, it's a pejorative word for their sect, or Majusi. Majusi is the, one of the favored terms. You would know what Majusi is because it's Magi. The, the kings that come to Jesus, they're the Pers from the east, right? The Persians. Majusi is Persian, pre-Islamic Persian. That's the bad name for Alawites because they're associated with non-Arab, non-Islamic, Zoroastrian Persians. And it's called Nizam and Majusi and so forth. That's the sort of denigrating, one of the denigrating words. Arafad, they reject Islam and they reject the, the, the Rashidun, the rightly guided caliphs. At any rate, Alawites, how do they get to the top? They are the poorest of the poor when the French arrive. They get to the top because the French draft them into the military. They draft, they create a military in order to suppress nationalist movement. The nationalist movement is led by Sunnis from the city in the 1920s. Who goes into the military supported by the French? Tons of minorities. Armenians, Druze, Ismailis, Alawites, all kinds of different, especially and Sunnis from the countryside because they're willing to shoot at these urban notable nationalists in the cities. When the French leave, the Alawites are a big minority in the army. By 1955, 65% of the non-commissioned officers are Alawite. Syria is very um, unstable, lots of coups up until 1970, and the Alawites go up the ranks very quickly as others are purged from the top. By 1970, Hafs al-Assad captures power, an Alawite, and he passes it on to his son in 2000, Bashar al-Assad. 
the Alawites since 1970 have held power through the Ba'ath Party. The vast majority of top generals are Alawite. The Ba'ath Party becomes an instrument for minorities. Now they make, they make, they also help the Christians. In 1945, about 15, 14 to 15 percent of Syrians were Christian. Today it's probably about 5 percent. Ismailis, Druze down here in the blue part, Kurds, lots of minorities were given a leg up under the Assad rule. And today, in the Arab Spring, in the Civil War, the minorities tend to support Assad. The Syrian rebel militias are Sunni Arab. And they're largely Sunni Arab from the countryside, rather than urban centers. But that split between minorities, Arab, Sunni majority, has been one of the characteristics that's defined this revolution. So let me, I've sort of walked you through this identity map of the minority. Here are the Christians in the Middle East in this great sorting out. This is a graph of Christians. Look at Egypt. Egypt, uh, in 1910, the Copts are more than 15%. Today, they're a little bit less than 10%, we believe. Syria, Christians go from being about 15% to possibly less than 5 today, 5%. We don't know the numbers, but probably less than 5. Palestine, Christians have gone. Uh, Iraq, Iraq, Christians, when we invaded 2003, probably about a million and a half Christians today, 400,000 to 300,000 Christians in Iraq. So the Christians have been leaving and driven out in this great sorting out, just as the Jews did before them. The Jews were the first to be sorted out. But there are many other minority groups in Iraq that have almost disappeared. You know what happened to the Yazidis most recently um, when ISIS took over and enslaved women, killed a lot of the men, and drove them out. In Mosul, when ISIS took over Mosul, 60,000 Christians fled in one day lost all their possessions on the way, their rings and so forth were taken off at roadblocks. Um, let's look at a map of Syria today. This is government controlled, the pink. They have the Alawite heartland and the coastal cities. They own probably about 70% of the population of Syria lives 65 to 70 percent lives in that pink government controlled area. The green are rebel militias that are not ISIS. The yellow on the top, Kurds. 10 percent of Syrians are Kurds, a different ethnic group, speaking their language is Indo European related to Persian. And then ISIS has the big desert region along the Euphrates from Raqqa, their capital, all the way through Deir ez-Zor down into Iraq. If you want to add in the bigger map of Iraq and Syria, this is ISIS at its height, you can see what's happened here is the Sunni parts of Iraq all opened their doors to ISIS. And ISIS took over in that one summer with almost no shots fired. It stops where they're Shiites, stops where they're Kurds. See that all that big yellow arc at the top is Kurdish, both in Syria and in Iraq. And on the coast, you get a mixed population. You get Alawites, you get Christians. Of course, there are a lot of Sunnis, but there's an urban aspect to this. The wealthier, middle, upper middle class have stayed with Assad, more or less, because they're worried about losing their money, their possessions, their privilege. The uprising is largely poor Sunnis from the countryside. But that's the map that you get. A Sunni state created by ISIS, wherever it was easy to conquer, and Sunnis would, were defected, were alienated from the governments. What is happening, in a sense, is that the, you, you, Iraq and the United States is helping the Iraqi government in Baghdad, a Shiite sectarian government, destroy the state and cut it in two, to keep international borders. 
Remember what we said about Europe, that the borders didn't change so much? It was the people that were changed to fit the borders. And once again, we can see why that happens, because the international order wants to keep these borders, which are UN mandated, they're, in, they're legally fixed, and it doesn't want to re-carve up the Middle East. So Russia is helping Assad, a very sectarian Shiite government, heterodox Shiite, destroy the Sunnis on his side and destroy ISIS as well as the rebel groups. So in a sense, you've got this big Sunni population stuck between Baghdad and Aleppo that's in between two bookends of Shiites that are getting international support to crush their attempt to become an independent nation. Of course, it's an independent nation under ISIS, which is abhorrent to most people. But the end product is, is that Sunnis are getting smashed. If you look at the towns of Tikrit or Ramadi that was just recently taken, not one house was left standing in Ramadi after America had bombed it and the Iraqi militias and military had gone in there. That's maybe not ethnic cleansing, but it's shades of gray. Um, okay, I'm going to slow down here and say, this is one aspect of what's happening, of how do we understand ISIS, in a sense, a radical Islamic interpretation that appeals to Sunnis and abhors Shiites that they call not Muslims, not the evil, super evil. The Shiites are calling these Sunnis jihadists, terrorists, Saudi fifth columnists, every bad name in the book complete demonization on both sides. The new identities are not so much ethnic as they are defined by religion. In a sense, the new national identities are religiously based instead of ethnically based as they were in Europe, where you've got Czechs and Slovaks who can't live together, right? And they have to split. Poles, Ruthenians, Jews, ethnically based national identity with Germany and Hitler being the apotheosis, the, the, the freaky nationalism at the, at the end of that ideal. Here, you've got ISIS, which is the freaky logical conclusion of religious identity, taking it to an extreme. But religious identity is putting itself forward. Jews against Muslims, Alawites, Shiites against Sunnis, Christians clinging to the coattails of dictators and other minorities who are fearful of getting driven out in this big stampede of elephants fighting each other. And that's, in a sense, um, what I'm going to leave you with here. And to say, you know, I don't know how this all works out. It has certain policy implications. If I were giving this talk in Washington, I would say, what can Washington really do? What can American power do? We've seen American power save Yazidis, drive back ISIS. We can tweak around the edges a little bit, do a little bit here, do a little bit there. But we've failed in our major effort, which is to create democracy in Iraq. We foolishly thought that we would get Iraqis to embrace each other and treat each other as equals and that we could destroy this very tyrannical state that was holding the country together but at the end of a whip. Regime change to promote democracy has not worked. Think Libya. Think Yemen. We've tried it in a hundred different ways now. We negotiated out the leader of Yemen. We bombed and left in Libya. We occupied and tried to rebuild in Iraq. We've done the same thing in Afghanistan, but we haven't had success, in part because we've launched terrible civil wars and this great sorting out process that we can't control, we don't understand, and which has defied 
We still think we're going to rebuild Iraqi nationalism and get Kurds, Shiites, and Sunnis to live together. And it's possible that, I don't know if we will, it just seems improbable. It's like getting Czechs and Slovaks to love each other. They live together forever. But in this world of nationalism, they just couldn't live with each other. Two more very developed, very advanced people, if you want to put it in that archaic language. But can you put this back together? Can Humpty Dumpty be put back together? That's the real question that weighs on everybody's minds. America presumes that it can, that there will be a unitary Syria, there will be a political solution. Assad will leave, but the Alawites will stay, the military will stay, and they will embrace the Sunni rebels who call them Majusi Arafad, and somehow live together with the rebels wanting an Islamic state and the minorities thinking, no, you've got to have secularism, Islam is terrible. It's not clear how we're going to do that. And I think, in that sense, Obama has been wise to keep us out of this swinging door. In a sense, he called for regime change, and then he thought better of it. He thought that Assad would fall on his own, and he'd be on the right side of history, and he'd be able to just get a win without having to do anything. But once it became clear that only America would be able to turn this guy out. He got cold feet. He said, I don't want to own Syria, because then I'm going to have to destroy all these different, build a new state. There are 1,500 militias in the rebellion, according to the CIA. You have to unify all those different tribes and militias, that all, many of which don't like each other and are fighting each other. And we did that in Iraq. It was very expensive. So he said, we're not going to do it. It's a bad deal, as Trump would say. Too expensive? <laughs> we're going to stay at home and build the middle class, not the Middle East. So that's the, you know, that's, I'm going to take questions. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to say thank you very much. So, Professor Landis will take questions, and if I can ask my faithful student to, if you raise your hand if you want a question, and let him come to you. Um, <clears throat> so, questions, yes. <clears throat> well, the situation is complicated by the fact that there are other fissures involved here, too. Uh, among the Sunnis, for instance, uh, you have the Wahhabi sect, and uh, you have the more moderate uh, Sufis. So we can see the Islamic State is actually attacking uh, various uh, Sunni clans as well. We can see in Afghanistan, where ISIS is moving in there, that Iran is making uh, some uh, league with uh, the Taliban, who are fundamentalist Sunnis, against uh, the greater threat of the ISIS Sunnis. Uh, so I mean, there are so many overlaps uh, that the biggest problem appears to be the uh, outside interference by proxy powers and the way that they're aligning themselves with the various forces on the ground, which keeps the pot stirred up. And the other problem, of course, is that the lines you say that are fixed were just fixed after the Second World War in a very hasty way, which uh, really didn't conform to a lot of the uh, demographic patterns and traditionally in the Middle East when the, when the Ottoman Empire was split up. So it appeared to me that uh, Obama has lost his way and that Putin is uh, certainly Take it, fill the void, but regardless, as long as these are proxy battles, it's going to make it very difficult for people on the ground to actually resolve these crises among themselves, isn't it? You're, you're absolutely right. Syria has become, this has become a proxy war. Iran, Russia, Iraq have all jumped in to Syria in order to build up Assad's government. If you take the shores of Lebanon to the edge of Iran, what's often called the Shiite Crescent, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. There are actually more Shiite Arabs in that area than there are Sunni Arabs. Sunni Arabs are 70% of Syria. But if you add the Iraqis and the Shiites of Lebanon in there, 
and the Sunnis of Lebanon, Sunnis of Syria, Sunnis of Iraq, you actually get more Shiites. Not many more, which is what makes this area so bloody complicated, because it's a, it's a battle royale between two rather equally distributed demographic groups. Very hard to separate them out. And Iran is determined to keep this, to build a new security structure, talking about proxy wars. Russia is too. They can see, we can take this away from America, from Saudi Arabia, Turkey, the Sunni world, and we can make it a Shiite band, security band, that will change inalterably, at least for a few decades, the nature of Middle East security architecture. That's why the Saudis have piled in. They do not want to see this Shiite crescent built up there. Lots of people in Washington are very vexed by it. They don't want Russia to do this. They're saying we've got to take Russia on. We've got to get in there, no fly zones. Whatever we have to do in Syria, we've got to defy Russian power and Iranian power. They're quintessentially evil, aggressive forces. We've got to take them down. The Saudis, the Emirates, Qatar, all our traditional allies. America, traditionally, has been a Sunni-loving power. We've supported Sunnis against Shiites. Iran, bad. Hezbollah, bad. Saudi Arabia, good. Turkey, big ally. Qatar, Emirates, Jordan. We love Sunnis. Down with the Shiites. Russia, in a sense, has tried to fill up that void, and Iran has too, by exploiting the, the discrimination that Shiites have been subjected to for hundreds of years in the Middle East. The Shiites of Lebanon had no power, Bahrain, Iraq, Yemen. Yeah, Yemen had more in the traditionally. But Iran found a role for itself by being the champion of Shiites and really ignited, in some ways, this sectarian war. But it was a, a big gaping hole that was just open because from the Ottoman Empire, had, Shiites weren't supposed to fight in the Ottoman Empire because they're not Muslims. They did fight, but they weren't legally supposed to fight. Alawites under the Ottoman Empire could not give testimony in a court of law because they were not people of the book. They were presumed to be liars who would never say anything right because you didn't have a book that you could swear on in a court of law. Jews and Christians could. Now, Alawites did turn up on occasion in Sunni courts under the Ottomans, but it was on occasion. So there was heavy discrimination, which these Shiites carried around with them, and they see a champion in Iran. At any rate, this proxy war, with Russia piling in and America piling in, makes it very difficult to sort out Syria, because America, Saudi Arabia, Turkey have been supplying the Sunni rebels with arms. Russia, Iran, Hezbollah supporting the Assad government. Neither side has supported theirs enough to win, but they won't let them lose. So in a sense, Syria is locked into this perpetual civil war. Um, very difficult. You know, Russia tried to come in and give a knockout blow, but um, the other powers don't want it. And we go on. So yes, you need to see the international context is important other than just the identity. Thank you. you have given a very persuasive um, and compelling analysis of the genesis of the problem. I wonder um, what your thoughts are on uh, the humanitarian dimensions um, of this crisis not only in Syria, but also in Yemen um, that we're uh, witnessing. At what point, in your judgment, those kinds of concerns should override even some of the strategic concerns, which I think in your very considered opinion um, should best be keep out, right? right? So at what point do you think the balance might shift towards an interventionist policy based on the 
obligation, shall we say, uh, to protect the minorities and uh, to uh, try to put an end uh, to, uh, to the savagery that, uh, that we're seeing. That we're seeing. Um, how, how can one relate your analysis to those considerations? Well, let's look at the presidential candidates for a second as a guide to what might come next. Trump said it's a bad deal. We don't want Muslims in this country. The Middle East is a bad deal. We should get out of NATO. We should get out of all these places. We've been spending tons of money. In a sense, Trump is a product of our misadventures in the Middle East. We've spent, according to Harvard analysts, over $3 trillion in Afghanistan and Iraq and the Middle East wars since 9-11. $3 trillion. In Oklahoma, where I come from, humble state, but proud, we've got a 20% budget shortfall this year. It's only $1.2 billion. $1.2 billion. And what are they doing? They're talking about a four-day school week. They're slashing many different teachers. It's a disaster. Oklahoma is 49th in this country in education. We're going to, get, we're going to beat Mississippi. If, we have any, if our legislators have anything to do with it. But it's a, sh it's, a, it's a shame. And that's why people are voting for Trump. Because they're sick and tired of the Washington elite spending trillions of dollars on things they don't even understand and ending up with a mess. So he doesn't want it. He likes Putin. He says, oh, we can work with Russia to solve the Syria problem. That was his one, he said that early on. He's changed his tune since then. But that's his gut feeling. I'm going to talk to Putin. We're going to make a deal. Cruz said regime change is stupid. And he blamed Obama. He said Obama made a mess. He did a Libya thing, and he killed Gaddafi, and the place is now a shambles. Look at Yemen. He's blaming all of that. Of course, he didn't mention Bush and Iraq, but he's, he's blaming regime change. He said, we need to stick with the dictators we know. So he's going back. He's abandoning American poli core policy of democracy promotion. Shocking. Hillary Clinton is the most pro-Syrian rebel. She said no fly zones, but that was before Russia jumped into Syria and gave them anti-aircraft missiles and, had, and jets and so forth. So she hasn't mentioned it since then. There's been some little, but it's not clear that any American wants to take on Syria. They've been almost silent in this campaign about Syria. They've talked about carpet bombing ISIS and turning a desert to glass and things like that. But that's only ISIS. That has nothing to do with humanitarian problem or solving the Syrian crisis or anything like that. So the, sh the long answer to your short question is I see a very bleak future for Syrians. I see the civil war going on for a long time because it's so embedded in this international struggle. Because the sorting out can't really happen easily here. Because the Sunnis are so many. You can't ethnically cleanse them. Where are they going to go? And you can't just beat them down and put them under your, your foot. Sabat the jesh ala the nes. And um, this, is, you know, this is the difficulty. Uh, so I don't see a good humanitarian outcome here. We haven't seen one in five years. America has spent about $5 billion on Syria. That's less than the spending. That's about equal to the spending of one week in Iraq at the height of our occupation. That's in five years. That tells you all you need to know about America's interest in Syria. We don't, we're not interested. And no president is going to start spending billions and billions of dollars on Syria. Because the American people will go crazy. Thank you. I thought that was an outstanding talk. Uh, I really appreciate you coming. Um, you started to answer my question just now, so hopefully I can ask you to expand on it a bit. Um, 
the story you told about Europe, um, I, my question was going to be, can't happen here. Because the story was, we had some polls, now Poland has all polls. We had this country that had some checks, now it has all checks. Um, that might happen in terms of the Christians, of course, leaving. But it can't happen because of this, uh, for the Sunnis because there's too many of them. So that, that was the exact premise of my question. So what I was going to ask is then to say, if we can't have the same ending to the story in the Middle East that we could have in Europe, um, do you think the great powers, the United States, Russia, etc., cetera, um, would reconsider their you know, fight to maintain borders as they're drawn? Uh, you, know, you can look at something certainly like Kurdistan, but elsewhere, because if at the end of the day, you're not going to have the sorting out with the populations to the point that you can have you know, homogeneous ethnic states, and you're not going to um, you know, make it so you can change borders, it seems like you're going to have perpetual Lebanese-type situations, which is unstable, pacted, consociational democracies that you, know, you never know when the next uh, torch is going to be lit and there's going to be a conflict. So could you see a change in the norm regarding border redrawing in this region, at least from the perspective of the great powers, or do you not see that? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. You know, I did a stupid thing a few years ago and went on Fareed Zakaria's show and said, the solution is dividing up the Middle East, redrawing borders. I can't tell you the stream of invective. It still hasn't ended today. He thinks he's the new sykes Pico. What are you doing in our world? You're trying to chop us up. Syrians love their country. They want to keep it together. Something like 76% of Syrians, when they're polled, say we want an integral Syria. Now, that's, most of those polls are a little bit old. I think if you offered Syrians that an end to the Civil War through some kind of partition, many would take it. You know, many of my Alawite friends, they would love to have an ethnic enclave. The trouble is, they don't want to fight anymore. They know they can't take all that area. They don't have enough Alawites to do it. The trouble is they can't fall back to an ethnic enclave because if they fall back and give up Damascus and Homs and Aleppo, they'll be overrun. So they're locked into this trying to put down these Sunni militias because if they don't and they fall back, they're going to end up in the sea. That's what they believe, and it might well come to pass. So, you know, in, in a sense, the most elegant solution at the beginning would have been if Obama had just wiped out Assad's state, right? And you'd gotten an ethnic cleansing of the Alawites. There are about three million of them. You could have driven out the Christians and the Alawites and have a Sunni state in Syria. That's what many of the militia leaders called for. They called for Zaharan Alush. For example, his brother Mohammed Alush is the spokesperson for the rebels in Geneva. Zahran Alush made a beautiful video two years ago. He did it at the summer palace of the Umayyad dynasty. The Umayyads were the first big Islamic empire, 700s. Capital was Damascus. He went out to, there's a, there's a beautiful ruin out in the desert. He went out to this desert ruin of the Umayyads and he said, with a lot of his militia guys, made a movie a film of himself, and he said, we are going to resurrect the Umayyad Empire, the Caliphate, and we are going to ethnically cleanse all of these Majusi, Arafad, horrible killers. The Umayyads failed to do it in their day, but we're going to do it. And you can see why it's very difficult to negotiate in Geneva when this is the sense of the background noise. Now, it didn't happen. The Alawites smashed the Sunnis, drove, what, four million plus. There's four and a half million Syrian refugees now. The vast majority are Sunnis. What has gone on is that the minorities have devastated Sunni power. And large numbers have ethnically cleansed. In Europe, the people coming to Europe are also many Iraqis. They're mostly Sunni Iraqis that are being driven out of places like Fallujah and others when they get smashed. Ramadi, and they're ending up in Europe. So they can't, they can't wipe them all out. So I don't, you know, yes, if somebody had done a Yugoslavia on this region, but think of what Yugoslavia took. Yugoslavia took NATO, 
the United States all agreeing to, in a sense, take on Russia. Russia was very weak at the time, so they were not a, a power in Yugoslavia. We could shunt them aside and not worry about them. And we're still there. There's still peacekeeping forces 25 years later in Yugoslavia. It's a major expense, a major effort. Many people would say it was smart to do it. Even though it's not a good solution, it was better than just letting them fight. Yes, that would have been a solution, but nobody cares about this region. That's the ultimate bottom line. America doesn't care, they don't want to get involved. The United States asked Turkey, you send your army in early on. They asked the Arab League, they asked the Saudis to intervene. Everybody rejected. They're willing to send arms to their favorite militia so they can have some, they can, you know, have some dogs in the fight and keep some leverage, but they don't want to go in and occupy. Because everybody saw what happened to America and Iraq and Afghanistan. Failure, expensive. So nobody's going to do it. That's the problem. And now that things are so devastated and bad, they're doubly not going to do it. Well, thank you for inviting me here. It's been a great pleasure.